Welcome to our video. China is ready for a world of disorder. America is not. I would like to focus on the commentary in Foreign Affairs, the 20th of June 2023, by Mr. Mark Leonard, Director of the European Council on Foreign Relations and the author of What Does China Think? and The Age of Unpeace, How Connectivity Causes Conflict. This is part two. China is confident that the United States is mistaken in its assumption that a new Cold War has broken out. Accordingly, it is seeking to move beyond Cold War-style divides. As Wang Honggong, a senior official at a think tank affiliated with China's Ministry of State Security, put it, The world is moving away from a center-periphery structure for the global economy and security and towards a period of polycentric competition and cooperation. Wang and like-minded scholars do not deny that China is also trying to become a center of its own. But they argue that because the world is emerging from a period of Western hegemony, the establishment of a new Chinese center will actually lead to a greater pluralism of ideas rather than a Chinese world order. Many Chinese thinkers link this belief with the promise of a future of multiple modernity. This attempt to create an alternative theory of modernity in contrast to the post-Cold War formulation of liberal democracy and free markets as the epitome of modern development, is at the core of Xi Jinping's Global Civilization Initiative. This high-profile project is intended to signal that unlike the United States and European countries, which lecture others on subjects such as climate change and LGBTQ rights, China respects the sovereignty and civilization of other powers. For many decades, China's engagement with the world was largely economic. Today, China's diplomacy goes well beyond matters of trade and development. One of the most dramatic and instructive examples of this shift is China's growing role in the Middle East and North Africa. This region was formerly dominated by the United States, but as Washington has stepped back, Beijing has moved in. In March, China pulled off a major diplomatic coup by brokering a truce between Iran and Saudi Arabia. Whereas Chinese involvement in the region was once limited to its status as a consumer of hydrocarbons and an economic partner, Beijing is now a peacemaker busily engaged in building diplomatic and even military relationships with key players. Some Chinese scholars regard the Middle East today as a laboratory for a post-American world. In other words, they believe that the region is what the entire world will look like in the next few decades. A place where, as the United States declines, other global powers, such as China, India, and Russia, compete for influence, and middle powers, such as Iran, Saudi Arabia, and Turkey, flex their muscles. Many in the West doubt China's ability to achieve this goal, mostly because Beijing has struggled to win over potential collaborators. In East Asia, South Korea is moving closer to the United States. In Southeast Asia, the Philippines is developing closer relations with Washington to protect itself from Beijing, and there has been an anti-Chinese backlash in many African countries where complaints about Beijing's colonial behavior are rife. Although some countries, including Saudi Arabia, want to strengthen their ties with China, they are motivated at least in part by a desire for the United States to re-engage with them. But these examples should not mask the broader trend. Beijing is becoming more active and steadily more ambitious. Economic competition between China and the United States is also increasing. Many Chinese thinkers predicted that the election of U.S. President Joe Biden in 2020 would lead to improved relations with Beijing, but they have been disappointed. The Biden administration has been much more aggressive toward China than they expected. One senior Chinese economist likened Biden's pressure campaign against the Chinese technology sector which includes sanctions on Chinese technology companies and chip-making firms, to U.S. President Donald Trump's actions against Iran. 
Many Chinese commentators have argued that Biden's desire to freeze Beijing's technological development to preserve the United States' edge is no different than Trump's efforts to stop Tehran's development of nuclear weapons. A consensus has formed in Beijing that Washington's goal is not to make China play by the rules, it is to stop China from growing. This is incorrect. Both Washington and the European Union have made it clear that they do not intend to shut China out of the global economy. Nor do they want to fully decouple their economies from China's. Instead, they seek to ensure that their businesses do not share sensitive technologies with Beijing and to reduce their reliance on Chinese imports in critical sectors, including telecommunications, infrastructure, and raw materials. Thus, Western governments increasingly talk of reshoring and friend shoring production in such sectors or at least diversifying supply chains by encouraging companies to base production in countries such as Bangladesh, India, Malaysia, and Thailand. Xi Jinping's response has been what he calls dual circulation. Instead of thinking about China as having a single economy linked to the world through trade and investment, Beijing has pioneered the idea of a bifurcated economy. One half of the economy, driven by domestic demand, capital, and ideas, is about internal circulation, making China more self-reliant in terms of consumption, technology, and regulations. The other half, external circulation, is about China's selective contacts with the rest of the world. Simultaneously, even as it decreases its dependence on others, Beijing wants to boost the dependence of other players on China so that it can use these links to increase its power and exert pressure. These ideas have the potential to reshape the global economy. The influential Chinese economist Yu Yangding has explained the notion of dual circulation with two new concepts, the spare wheel, and the body lock. Following the spare wheel concept, China should have ready alternatives if it loses access to natural resources, components, and critical technologies. This idea has come in response to the increasing use of Western sanctions, which Beijing has watched with concern. The Chinese government is now working to shield itself from any attempts to cut it off in case of a conflict by making enormous investments in critical technologies, including artificial intelligence and semiconductors. But Beijing is also attempting to exploit the new reality to reduce the global economy's reliance on Western economic demand and the U.S.-led financial system. At home. The CCP is promoting a shift from export-led growth to growth driven by domestic demand. Elsewhere, it is promoting the yuan as an alternative to the dollar. Accordingly, the Russians are increasing their yuan reserve holdings, and Moscow no longer uses the dollar when trading with China. The Shanghai Cooperation Organization has recently agreed to use national currencies, rather than just the dollar, for trade among its member states. Although these developments are limited, Chinese leaders are hopeful that the weaponization of the U.S. financial system and the massive sanctions against Russia will lead to further disorder and increase other countries' willingness to hedge against the dollar's dominance. The body lock is a wrestling metaphor. It means that Beijing should make Western companies reliant on China thereby making decoupling more difficult. That is why it is working to bind as many countries as possible to Chinese systems, norms, and standards. In the past, the West struggled to make China accept its rules. Now, China is determined to make others bow to its norms, and it has invested heavily in boosting its voice in various international standard-setting bodies. Beijing is also using its global development and Belt and Road initiatives to export its model of subsidized state capitalism and Chinese standards to as many countries as possible. Whereas China's objective was once integration into the global market, the collapse of the post-Cold War international order and the return of 19th-century-style disorder have altered the CCP's approach.
she has therefore invested heavily in self-reliance. But as many Chinese intellectuals point out, the changes in Chinese attitudes toward globalization have been driven as much by domestic economic challenges as by tensions with the United States. In the past, China's large, young, and cheap labor force was the principal driver of the country's growth. Now, its population is aging rapidly, and it needs a new economic model. One built on boosting consumption. As the economist George Magnus points out, however, doing so requires raising wages and pursuing structural reforms that would upset China's delicate societal power balance. Rekindling population growth, for instance, would require substantial upgrades to the country's underdeveloped social security system, which in turn would need to be paid for with unpopular tax increases. Promoting innovation would require a reduction of the role of the state in the economy, which runs counter to Xi Jinping's instincts. Such changes are hard to imagine in the current circumstances. That's all. This is part two, to be continued to part three.